Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms, to complimentary hot breakfast. Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day. And for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On The Birds. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And tonight we've got a lot to get to, including some injury news, both good and bad, that has occurred since our last show last week. We're also going to talk about some interesting trends that have unfolded over the first couple of weeks of the minor league season. Shout out our players outside the top 30 for their performances and talk a little bit about the hot start that Hudson Haskin is having down at double A buoy. But at the beginning of each show, we always have to shout out new members of our Patreon community. And we've got a couple of people to shout out this week. So I'll turn it over to Bob. Yeah, we got five new Patreon members. And I think we might have a few more after we talk about something else in a second. But uh, let's shout out these guys first. Eric Garfield. Everybody knows Eric Birdland on Twitter. Shout out to him. Appreciate the love he's showing us. Ethan, welcome aboard. Santiago Taboda. Uh, Brooks Phelan. Shout out to my cousin. And Corey Roll. Hopefully no relation to Billy Roll. 
uh, former <laughs> Orioles draft pick that it was a bust. But no, thanks, guys, and welcome aboard. And yeah, so today we recorded an interview with the big man himself, Michael Elias, and wasn't planned this way the interview just happened to come out two weeks early or for us to record two weeks early so as a benefit to the patrons we're gonna release that to them early tonight or tomorrow morning and it will eventually go out to everybody as episode 100 in two weeks but if you want to hear it earlier you can always sign up for for the patron but definitely no pressure to do so yeah it was a great conversation we'll definitely have more reflection as part of our 100th episode which is just two weeks away and we've actually got a lot in the works uh, here and on the verge for the next two or three weeks. And we'll get to that in a little while. We'll start off with some of the injury news because last week was a rough stretch for the Orioles when it came to player injuries. I'll just name off some of the players that have hit the IL since our last show. Kyle Bronovitz, Toby Welk, Taron Vavra, Noel Berth Romero, and Raul Rangel. Now, mind you, not all of these injuries are created equal. Some are better than others. Some are worse than others. And even coming into tonight's show, some of these injuries were, you know, first reported a few days ago, and we still don't know the full extent of them. But obviously, we hope these players make as quick of a rebound as possible. It sounds like in the case of Kyle Bronovitz that he is going to be out for a while. I believe Toby Welk is also on the 60-day IL for Bowie, so he looks like he could be out for quite a bit. But, Nick, I'll just start with you because – it did seem like kind of a rough trend last week where we'd be going through the games, someone would get hurt, but it's also, unfortunately, I think a product when you get in the early stages of the season, sometimes where these nagging injuries can pop up, which not all of these are nagging. I think some of them are going to prove to be more severe, but some of them might set players aside for a couple of weeks. Yeah. I've seen some comments already that suggest like the world is ending. Uh, But I think that was more just, like you mentioned, they all seem like back to back to back in like a 48 hour window. It seemed like all of these guys went down. But I mean, when I look at it, like if you kind of look at who's injured, though, it's like using you know, Diaz earlier on. Obviously, I think we all could have seen that one coming. Taron Vavra, we've mentioned this before on the show that Taron Vavra actually does have a very long history of injuries. Uh, and it's just that one hurts the most for me because I've mentioned before that I've really enjoyed watching him play in AAA. Uh, I don't think anyone in this system battles like he does. Uh, and that's that's a huge compliment to this entire system. But Vavra, I think, is a step above a lot of guys. Uh, and so now hopefully he's not out for a super long time because I really imagine him being a contributor in the major league level at some point this year. Um, Bronovich, yeah, nothing confirmed yet uh, by actual sources. But um, Norfolk Broadcast did mention that like it, it he's going to be out for a significant amount of time. So we can only speculate there but it doesn't sound good and Ron Hell's injury I know Sam Jelinek the broadcaster for Delmar Shorebird is like yeah he's only throwing I think he said like 83 84 miles an hour and he couldn't find the strike zone was removed after an inning uh, so when you throw like 90 92 93 regularly um, that's uh, that's a big issue I think so that's waiting for confirmation there um, but yeah it's it's tough but on the bright side like Carter Bomber's coming back we saw eric's video today he threw in a game today uh i got video over the over the weekend of brandon hanafee throwing in florida off a of mound he is getting ready to go um you're seeing a lot of guys come back from injuries as well so that's uh, it's balancing out so it's balancing itself out here i think and there's also one other name i didn't mention this before the show either i just forgot uh daryl hernays he did leave a game the other day and hasn't he's missed the last two or three days he hasn't returned he walked off the field with a trainer, and I have no idea what happened because it's just like a routine fly ball. I took his batting gloves off and was like, all right, let's play the field, but he never made it back out in the field. So I don't know what's going on with Hernays there, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah, I don't think Hernays was ever actually put on the injured list, so hopefully that's no. a good sign, kind of like Kyle Stowers where, oh, he's going to miss a month. No, he missed two games, and, and he's fine. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, you're not going to – it's it's baseball. There's going to be injuries We are a deep farm system with a lot of names we're paying attention to. So, of course, it's going to stand out when a few of them come up lame, come up with some injuries, hopefully shorter than uh, the worst fears could be expected. But you also have guys like Anthony Servideo, who's still working his way back. He should be back relatively soon, from what I understand. And Adley is going to be in Aberdeen as soon as tomorrow to rehab and get back to the major league level. Same with D.L. Hall. I mean, he's not rehabbing, but he's working his way back. Rico Garcia 
you know, we got to hold our hopes <laughs> out for him. I don't even remember who he is exactly, but he's on a rehab. Uh, so, yeah, you got guys coming back. You're going to have guys pop up with injuries. It's it's baseball. But, you know, I don't think it's anything to be super concerned about early on. Yeah, I agree. And unfortunately, it's just sort of a byproduct of baseball in April. Sometimes I think the players come out of camp and – Mind you that some of the players we just talked about are not on the 40 man. So they had a longer spring training. Um, and this can unfortunately happen. It's part of the game and it's not a part of the game. Anybody enjoys, but it's unfortunately part of it. And I did want to mention um, at this point, Daryl Hernandez is not on the 40 or not on the IL for Del Marva. We're recording this on Monday night, a little bit after eight o'clock. As of this point in time, he is on the active roster and Greg Collin is working his way back on a rehab assignment. He played for the Shorebirds a little bit last week. So there's a player that is coming back. And do want to touch on Adley Rutzman and D.L. Hall going to Aberdeen next week because we know that there's going to be a lot of attention paid to these players as they come back from injury, especially Hall because he missed so much of last summer. And the question is, can he stay healthy get to the major leagues this year, as we expect. With Rutzman, I think that everything has probably been handled pretty methodically, and he's going to go to Aberdeen for a little bit, probably go to Norfolk, and maybe we see him with the Orioles sometime next month. But it's still going to be an interesting week there with those two guys um, wearing the Irons, Iron Birds uniform. Yeah, I'll be at the game tomorrow night. Hopefully you get to see Adley behind the plate. I know Gene Pinto is starting, and maybe D.L. Hall will get his his appearance, his first appearance of the year. So going to look forward to that. But just good to see these guys back out there. And what are we thinking with Adley? Do we think a week in Aberdeen? Is he going to just tour the upper minors, like a week in Aberdeen, a week in Bowie, a week in Norfolk, and then end up in Baltimore when they get home for that longer uh, homestand coming up? Possibly. I just put up Norfolk's schedule to look, may, thinking because I know Bowie is in Richmond this week, which – it's still close, but obviously you probably want your guys at home at their home ballparks. Uh, but Norfolk is Bowie's back home next week, and Norfolk goes from they're in Gwinnett this week, and then they go to Nashville. That's gonna be cool playing the Nashville Sounds, a new opponent. Oh, the Orioles, I, home, uh, <laughs> home state, yeah. Uh, future, future triple A team. Um, <laughs> no, that, that's pretty cool because Nashville, I think they're new to the international league this year. Um, but yeah, so they're in Nashville next week. They don't come home till the 10th. So maybe it could be Aberdeen, Bowie, then Norfolk, then the big leagues. Um, it doesn't seem like there was too, too much information about more specifics with Adley's injury. So I think it is going to take probably a longer ramp up than a lot of fans, what they want to see, unfortunately. But I don't know. Yeah, I think they're going to go about it methodically because – for as good as Adley Rutzman is going to be and for as much of an impact as I think he's going to have right away on this team, especially because the Orioles really have not been hitting well over the first few weeks of the season, you don't want to rush him there and have him struggle because he's not 100% or close to it yet or have something else happen again with the injury. So if they're going to be methodical about it, I'm fine with that. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, is the Orioles do have two long road trips in May which is why when we did our predictions, so I think I picked the opening of the Mariners series at the end of May as when I thought Rutschman would debut. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but my guess is that it's going to be based on who was home over the next few weeks. Uh, and like Nick mentioned, it would be Bowie next week, Norfolk the week after, and then probably have him in AAA for a couple of weeks before bringing him up to the majors. My guess right now would be, you know, a reasonable timeline. Which could line him up to come up at the same time as Grayson Rodriguez, if we're looking at him to come up end of May, early June, potentially. And, yeah, I can't wait to see Adley uh, frame job Julio Rodriguez for another <laughs> call to strike three that was a ball outside. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's that Mariner series, like – I'm going to have to find some way to get up to Baltimore. Uh, it is tough right now just to go to the store, but um, I'm going to find a way to drive three hours up to Baltimore because if I can see Adley Rushman make his debut and see Julio Rodriguez up in the majors, maybe it's Grayson Rodriguez versus Logan Gilbert or just Logan Gilbert throwing for the Mariners. Like that's That would be a pretty fun uh, series to go to at Camden Yard. It's not going to lie. 
Yeah, maybe we can get our first major league press passes for that game and uh, <laughs> all go together. Well, there are two like great, potentially great prospect series in May at Camden Yards. You have the Royals coming in early in the month with Bobby Witt Jr. Then you got the Mariners coming in later in the month. Now, as much fun as it would be to see the top two picks from the 2019 draft go at it with Rutzman and Witt, I feel like right now that the later in the month might be a more realistic time frame. But still, like it's kind of fun to talk now about Adley Rutzman being back on the field and actually think about, oh, when could he debut? What is his next few weeks going to look like? Yeah, I mean, maybe it will be performance dependent. Maybe, you know, if he comes out and looks like, you know, he's still getting in the swing of things, he's he's not exactly lighting the world on fire, just needs some more time, then they'll take more time. But if he comes out and he's just like hitting 350 with eight home runs over the first two weeks, then bring him right on up. I guess, you know, time will tell. But I think it's going to be hard if he's just killing the ball to just keep him down there for four or five weeks. Yeah, and with Dio Hall too, like, you know, Elias has said that if Hall's healthy and he's ready to go and he's performing well, then like Sim can tribute coming in strong with that comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're like DL Hall. This this it's promising to see him in game action so soon. I was curious about when were we going to see him? Where do we see him in Delmarva for a little bit first, like a couple weeks in Delmarva, then Aberdeen, then Bowie. Uh, then maybe a cup of coffee in Norfolk, but if he's going to hit the ground running in Aberdeen, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a buildup for him, obviously, but could this still put him on a timeline for if everything goes well, and that's a lot that has to go right, but could Hall still be on that timeline for reaching the major leagues at some point at the end of the year for maybe a couple of relief appearances or something, but it's, it's good that they're all going to be back on the field now. My thought is combining what you just said with Hall starting all the way up and not all the way up, but higher than the the bottom rung in Aberdeen with the comments that Elias made earlier in spring that, you know, you're going to see DL Hall to major league level sooner than maybe you think. Maybe, maybe they just plan on getting him up here by June or July and using him as a reliever, at least this season, like uh, Michael Ballman is kind of getting that treatment right now at the major league level, or maybe he starts and it's like Tyler Wells types of starts where it's three, four innings max, but I don't know. It's it's exciting if if he comes out and is commanding the ball again. It's going to be hard to. You're going to hear Orioles fans uh, tweeting a lot about. Let's get him up here. Well, it's something else too. I don't want to give anything away from our interview with Mike Elias, but there was a comment that he made, and if my math is correct, and I'm looking at this list correct, mm-hmm. um, that gives me even more uh, belief that they want the Hall in the majors pretty soon, Ed. They think it could be a possibility. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I almost brought that up, but I didn't want to ruin it either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and when Michael Elias talked in the spring about you know when we could see Hall in the major leagues, I kind of changed my calculus a little bit because leading up to spring training, especially with the lockout, I was kind of taking a more conservative approach with Hall, where it's like, okay, we might see him at the end of the year, we might not. Maybe it's possible that he goes all of this year pitching double A AA and triple A and doesn't get to the majors. But when I saw that, the comments that Michael Elias made in camp, which Bob just touched on a second ago, I kind of felt like, okay, you're going to see Hall this year as long as he's healthy and producing. And I think that having him start now, especially at high A, might be a way to kind of manage the innings a little bit where maybe his first outing in Aberdeen is only an inning long but you start to build him up a little bit to where if he's in the rotation or he's in the bullpen in August, you can run him out there for at least three innings. Yeah. That, that natural sound uh, audio this week is going to be, uh, it's going to be taken up a level uh, in Aberdeen. That's this is really good. And Tuesday night, uh, since most people are probably listening to this Tuesday morning, hopefully uh, Tuesday night, like they're going to be the only show uh, in town. So since everybody, all three other affiliates are playing at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, I didn't realize until right before we came on the air. Uh, so yeah, this is a great opportunity for the Ironbirds. If you're close by, like get out there Tuesday night, support these guys, and uh, get a quick look at Adley before he's in an Orioles uniform. Should I hop on the YouTube channel and do a live stream from the park <laughs> and, and call the game while I'm there? I don't know. I, I, we're op- the DMs are open, Aberdeen. We said it before, and we keep saying it. Well, 
11 a.m. That probably means there's a lot of education mm-hmm. days uh, around minor league baseball mm-hmm. tomorrow, and um, they're an experience. I'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> we'll move on now to the segment where we're going to kind of talk about interesting trends uh, that have unfolded over the first couple of weeks. And for the most part, you know, it's all positive. And we're kind of focusing on things that are happening either broadly with the teams or with players that are highly ranked in our own top 50 list. And we don't know, and, you know, we'll talk about our own picks individually, but we don't know how these are going to sustain themselves over the course of a few months, let alone a few weeks. But there's still interesting things to point out. And I want to start with Bob, who has something down here about walk rates for the top three levels in the minor league system. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. I know it was a big thing at the major league level with the Orioles. Oh my gosh, they're you know top five in walks or what have you. Well, it's it's the majors. It's Triple A. It's Double A. It's High A. You know, low A, not as much, but that I've talked about on our daily recaps that that's just a different calculation as far as success at the minor league level goes this year for the Orioles. But Triple A Norfolk, they lead the International League in on base percentage and are right up. I think they're second in total walks. Double A Bowie is second in on base percentage in the Eastern League and right up there in total walks as well. And Aberdeen is second in on base percentage in the South Atlantic League, which is still weird to say because that used to be Delmarva. They're only. 0.001 percentage point behind Rome for the lead there. And they also have a bunch of total walks. So it's just great to see that these, I know, again, <laughs> trying not to reference uh, the interview we did earlier today, Elias made it seem like maybe we're just on the same ground as everybody. But to my eyes, we're at the top of these leaderboards in every level. That has to say something. And if you go to more player specifics, Gunnar Henderson has a 22.2 walk percentage, which is fourth best total in uh, the Orioles minor league system. And one of the guys ahead of him only has nine plate appearances and he's only got a 19% strikeout rate. That to me is the most encouraging single performance when it comes to walk rate. Yeah, that's the fantastic one. Like Gunnar Henderson and still just 21 years old. So that's what, like three, three and a half years younger than the competition, probably closer to four years younger than the competition at double a, uh, I don't know how many pitchers younger than him he's faced this year. Uh, so, like, that's fantastic considering Gunnar Henderson. I think one of the issues you've heard with him coming up over the last year or so is the strikeout numbers. Uh, and so far, so good. And Jordan Westberg as well. That's another guy where you heard a lot of, yeah, but he strikes out a lot. And he's still striking out about a quarter of the time, 25%, but he's got almost a 20% walk rate. Um and so, yeah, there's just a lot of guys you see in Norfolk's lineup are you know, Jemai Jones. And we can talk about him in a minute, too. He's been slumping a little bit and he's kind of completely he made me look bad after my praise of his that for last week's episode. But guys like Tyler Nevin, Ryland Bannon, like these are guys who could be contributors to the major league level are probably better options than what we're currently seeing in the major league level in some positions. And they're getting on base. They're doing damage. Uh, and so that's really positive to see. And like you mentioned, it's at every single level. Delmarva is the exception. Delmarva is actually has some kind of absurd strikeout rates and swinging strike rates. Uh, but I don't think, I think this was after our last episode. John Mioli, if you didn't catch it, had a fantastic piece about Delmarva. He was down there, wrote about Moises Chasse, wrote about the learning experience that's going on in Delmarva. So that is, like Bob said, a a unique area right now of prospects. Uh, But hopefully they start to turn things around. But yeah, those numbers look absolutely fantastic so far through the rest of the system. With Henderson, I think it goes back to the end of last year. It felt like there was a lot of scouting the stat stat line going on outside of like the Orioles prospect world where it's like, oh, Gunnar Henderson looks like a three true outcome setter. He was a three true outcome hitter for like the last month of the season or the last six weeks of the season. He was not that hitter all year. And I think that what we're seeing is him getting more comfortable with the older competition. And I agree with you, both of you, that the walk rate where it has been this year, especially in comparison to strikeout rate, which is lower than the walk rate right now by about three percentage points, is a big deal for him. So you know when you see that, that his plate approach is locked in and He didn't hit his first home run the season until late last week, but he made a count because that ball still has not come down. (laughs) Yeah, 112 miles per hour, 108 miles per hour. Yeah, Gunnar Henderson last year 
even in low A, had like a 30% strikeout rate. Same with high A. And then it was almost 60% in his little taste of double A. So that is a huge improvement. And, you know, it's still only 14 games. But from what we've we talked about it last week, Zach, you mentioned it, that strikeout rate and walk rate are kind of the the ones that kind of stabilize a little a little quicker than other stats. So it's a very good sign. And Kyle Stowers is similar. His strikeout rate's down to like 15-something percent. It's good to see. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to bring up next. 15.6% strikeout rate for Kyle Stowers, 13.3% walk rate. Uh, he struck out – these are his strikeout rates of the previous three stops last year at high A, double A, and triple A, 34%, 30%, 34%. So he's cut that by in more than half. That's 24 – or sorry, that's his age. 10-game sample size. <laughs> he missed a couple of games there. Uh, but still, that's a guy who, again – Orioles fans want to see in the major leagues fairly soon and a guy who could contribute in the major leagues fairly soon. And you got a 171 WRC plus you're not striking out. You're getting on base at a huge rate. Like that's huge. Yeah. And you want to, oh, sorry, Zach, I was just going to say, you want a, a reason not to worry about Colton Kowser who has a 36% strikeout rate so far and still a 12% walk rate, which is pretty solid. Just look at this. Just look at the the evidence that the Orioles can get their strikeout percentages down. Not to mention, we just know that Colton Kowser is not going to strike out this much over the long haul. But, you know, it's a blip on the radar. And the fact that Kyle Stowers can go cut his strikeout percentage in half and Henderson can almost do the same, then I'm pretty sure Kowser can get back on track. Yeah, I completely agree, Bob. And with Stowers, to me, when I have seen him this year, he looks even better than he did last year. There, there is something there that when you watch him at the plate, he has a better plate approach than I think he had last year. I think that time in Major League Camp was good for him, and I think that whatever work he was putting into his performance leading up to the 2021 season, which was something that Matt Blood talked about when he was on our show a little more than a month ago, he's continued to stick to that, it seems like. You know, he's having good at-bats, he's cutting back on the strikeouts, and he's hitting at a place right now well, you normally don't really see power numbers in the month of April. Norfolk can be a tough hitter's park, especially early in the year. And the power is there. Um, so we know what he can do. And it's given me a lot of hope that as long as he stays healthy, you're going to see him contributing at the major league level by sometime this summer. Yeah, Norfolk's a tough place to hit him runs unless you're Robert Neustrom, who just hits him out of anywhere, or Bryce Harper. I mean, Johnny Reiser with a 288 ISO and 13% walk rate. Uh, still can't get over that one. Uh, but yeah, Stowers, to me, he just looks confident. I feel like he's just more comfortable with the approach that he kind of gleaned onto with Ryan Fuller last year and company. And yeah, he just looks so real, like, I don't know, he just feels like a big leaguer at this point. And, you know, it's just got a, another month or two, and, and I think he will be. Yeah, I think one of you mentioned before we hopped on kind of compare his numbers through that, that first series and then look at his numbers the last week. They they look a little bit better. Yeah, I think he struck out three times on Sunday, but uh, he was performing well going into that Sunday game. Uh, so it looks like he's adjusting. Maybe they are trying to get more power out of the bat. Maybe they're tinkering with some things right now. It's early in the year. We know he's a high floor prospect. We know he had the skill sets are there. The hit tool is fantastic. So maybe let's just tinker with some stuff now and see if it works. And if we need to go back to what we need to go back to, then – they can, but I think just overall, and also you look at just among qualified hitters, like in the system, looking at walk rates as a whole, like Taryn Vavra, Gunnar Henderson, Robert Newstrom, and John Rhodes. Well, John Rhodes is, is equal, but these guys have more walks than strikeouts. Uh, John Rhodes, both at 12 and a half percent, both. And John Rhodes is, has one of the lowest swinging strike rates in all of minor league baseball. Uh, so a lot of good news. And so now if you're hitting the ball hard, a lot of high OPSs, a lot of high number of home run totals here. Things are trending in the right direction, and no no need to worry about Colton Kowser right now. And give it another month, and if he's struggling, like I said last week, we can have a bigger conversation then, but don't worry about Colton Kowser. And just to continue to be all over the place, uh, Kobe Mayo, uh, he's got a 9.5% walk rate, 20 years old in high A. That's pretty good, and he's only striking out 20% of the time. So, yeah, while the, the raw numbers aren't exactly as electric as when he was in FCL and Delmarva, last season the underlying metrics are there that he's still the same guy yeah the whole system is i think it was steve molesky that had that tweet the other day like this whole system is full of guys who are playing against much older competition you look at the combined rosters at each of these three levels triple a double a and high a 
uh, they're very young compared to their peers. So I think that makes these numbers even more impressive. Absolutely. And Nick, I'll turn it over to you now because you have some thoughts on the AAA lineup. Yeah, just a couple of guys who you know we've talked about, like, can they contribute at the major league level or, or not? Do they have one more shot before the Orioles kind of move on from them? Uh, and that was Tyler Nevin, Ryland Bannon, and Jemai Jones. And I wanted to see, they got off the hot starts, but we saw stretches out of them last year that were hot and extremely cold. They're three series into this season, and they've each played about 14, 15, 16 games. And so far, like, they're still hanging on strong, except for Jemai Jones. Um, but, yeah, like, Jones is really on a cold streak, making a lot of bad talk about swing decisions. He's swinging a lot at balls way out of the zone, uh, which are you know, head shaking. But you look at Ryland Bannon, he's got a 441 on base percentage and a 154 WRC plus. He's been playing a really good third base. Tyler Nevins hitting 382. He's got a 444 on base percentage. He's not striking out like a minimal strikeout rate, more line drives. His WRC plus is like 177. And remember, 100 is league average. For anyone who may not be as familiar with that stat, Um, these are just 14, 15, 16 games, but I don't see any sign of these guys slowing down tremendously. Like they hit these walls last year Uh, and Nevin as well. Kudos to Nevin because I thought he's kind of like this black hole at third base. Like you had a ball over there. He's not getting to it. Uh, He made a lot of just I don't want to say bonehead. That's not the right word, but just like what are you doing out there plays defensively? And this year it's like what are you doing? Like what changed? It's a different, (laughs) what are you doing this year with Tyler Nevin? I've been very impressed. Um, I know Fangraphs is rough on him saying like, this is a, he's going to be like a KBO star or a Japanese baseball star this time next year, but he's performing extremely well in Norfolk. And Chris Owens has what, like two hits all year. Odor's OPS is like 300, 400 something. Like, I think you got to give these guys a shot here and let's see what you got. Yeah. First of all, I compared (laughs) Tyler Nevin to a poor man's Mark Trumbo defensively last year. And apologies, Tyler, (laughs) for for that. But, uh, yeah, you're making me look bad there and making Tim DeJohn look good. Um, I think we need to do a three for two special, get rid of Odor, Owings, and Gutierrez once the rosters go from 28 to 26 and bring up either one or both of Tyler Nevin, Ryland Bannon, and maybe a guy who's going really under the radar, but... He looked great in spring, and he's off to a great start this year. Richie Martin, of all guys, 27 years old now. He's got an 11% walk rate, striking out under 22% of the time. He's got an OPS near 900, 220 ISO. I, I mean, he's he's looks like a different guy. I mean, maybe it's a mirage. It's still short sample size, but I'd still rather see Richie Martin at this point than Chris Owings, Rugnet Odor, or Kelvin Gutierrez out there. Yeah, Rognetto Adore, Chris Owings, or Kelvin Gutierrez are not going to be around when the Orioles are competing again. And you need to try to get the younger players who you think can be part of the solution in some way uh, playing time this year. And I really wish that, you know, one of the drawbacks, like Tim DeJohn was a great guest when he came on. But one of the things that we couldn't do because we were in the middle of the lockout was talk about players who were on the 40-man roster, which is a shame because, I really wanted to know what kind of work was going in with Tyler Nevin at third base. And my sense, and I think that if this is correct, the Orioles are going the right way, is to really challenge him at third base. Because we know he's not going to find an opening at first base or either of the corner outfield spots. So if he could play even a serviceable third base and do what he's done throughout his minor league career, which is really not strike out, walk at a high rate, give you good line drive power that – at Canham Yards maybe gives him a little bit more home run power, that's enough to at least be a viable solution for the rest of this year and to kind of be a bridge to, you know, Jordan Westberg or Gunnar Henderson or Kobe Mayo or whoever, or, you know, stick around for a while as a guy that you can put at any of the corners. And Bannon Bannon looks to me like the Ryland Bannon of 2019. I made that point on Locked on Orioles recently, and – he kind of looks like he's back to the Ryland Bannon that we saw before last year. The question mark for him is, you know, we know he can get on base. He can hit for a good hour. He doesn't have a ton of power, though, and has been generally okay on defense, but not great. But I think if he plays a serviceable third base and can give you some starts at second, the Orioles should look at promoting him sooner rather than later. And, I, and Bob, I agree with you, too, about Martin. I, I would like to see him get an opportunity, especially if 
you know, some of the players in the major league level now continue to struggle. Yeah. yeah and go ahead, Nick. I was, I don't, I don't know if, you know, Bannon and Evan are like future, like full-time options there, but you, Zach said the word bridge. I think they are much better bridges uh, than, you know, Odor, Owens and Gutierrez. And yeah, with Richie Martin, like uh, I'm not getting fooled again. I can't yet <laughs> prove me wrong, Richie, but I think I said this in a daily, like I, He's been playing fantastically for Norfolk. I will give him that credit. I was on the Richie Martin bandwagon for a while last year. I thought, put him in AAA, let him do this, and then bring him back up to the major leagues. But this could be a real late bloomer option. But I don't know if I can fall for that again. I'm I'm not doing it yet. Yeah, just talking about Bannon, the thing with him, and that's so funny what you just said about Richie Martin. Um, He's walking more than he did last year, 16.2%. But he's actually striking out like 6% more. His ISO is 50 points down from last year. The difference is instead of a 176 batting average for balls in play, he's at 444. So he's having great luck compared to last year when he had awful luck. So let's just say somewhere in the middle. And he's right now he's got a 154 WRC+. plus. So let's just call him 10% better than average. And that's 10% plus another 10 or 20% better than the guys currently on the Orioles are than average. On to my trend now, what I'm going to highlight is one player's performance, and that's Cesar Prieto. Uh, what did we hear about Prieto coming into this year? Good feel for the strike zone, good contact hitter, can hit the ball over the place but doesn't hit for power. Ceiling's probably that of like a Nick Madrigal. Comps with someone like Eric Sogard. Two good infielders that don't hit for a lot of power. What we've seen so far, though, is that through 15 games and 63 plate appearances, Prieto has 16 homers, 13 RBIs, a slugging percentage of 679, an OPS of 1.060. Now, Aberdeen was just in Greensboro, and we did not have MILB TV down there. So other than one video that he posted to his Instagram that was taken from a center field camera angle, we don't know how far those balls went. And I can tell you, from having covered the South Atlantic League for a lot of years. Greensboro is a bit of a band box. But the home runs that we have on tape at Aberdeen, which is a pitcher's park, Prieto got all of them. He crushed those balls. Those were not wall scrapers. And I'm curious to see what you guys think about this because home runs, like anything else, can come in batches and prove to be completely unsustainable. Um, DJ Stewart in 2020 is probably the poster child for that. Or... Maybe Prieto has found something here where he's not necessarily a 20, 25 home run hitter down the line, but maybe that low to mid double digit home run total is possible for him, which is good for a second baseman, especially one that, you know, solid defender doesn't strike out, going to hit for a high average. Yeah. I think, you know, that is a good point about, you know, home runs can kind of come and go and you don't want to sit here and say like, Prieto is going to be a 25 home run hitting the second baseman at the major league level, but he's adjusting extremely well. Like that's what I, my takeaway from this is that he has hit the ground running, literally driving the ball out, out of these fields. Uh, and that's impressive. Like, yeah, I know all the reports after the Orioles signed him were like, this could be a guy who could be in the major leagues, maybe at the end of this year, possibly for sure next year, if everything goes right. Uh, quick riser should start in the upper minors, but still like it, it's still a big adjustment going from, I know it's professional baseball in Cuba, but now you're over here in the United States and you can say like maybe professional baseball in Cuba is like equivalent to high A. I don't like all those comparisons. Like the KBO is low A Japanese baseball league is double A. Like I don't like all those comps. Like this is different. It's a lifestyle adjustment, cultural adjustment uh, and getting used to a new type of of pitcher, uh, what he's doing. And right now he's hitting the ground running, performing extremely well. Um, I like that for him. If the power sticks, that's fantastic. I don't think anybody had him leading the Orioles minor league hitters uh, at any point in home runs, him and Johnny Reiser nipping on his heels there. But uh, yeah, that's fantastic. And the walks at the beginning of the year, that those were non-existent. And now this past week, he's got more walks and strikeouts. So he's obviously seeing the ball well. He's driving the ball well. Defense, I haven't really paid too much attention to. They've had him kind of all over the place. Uh, so we'll, we'll see about that. But I think in the very, very near future, You know, the Orioles aren't going to let him just sit around and twiddle his thumbs in high A. So I think you've got to wait for something to happen at the major league level first, and then you're going to see a massive ripple effect. And hopefully that's in the next couple of weeks, because normally I 
every time somebody goes on like a two game hot streak, everybody's like, promote him now. He needs to move up. This guy needs to move up a level. And I, it's so annoying. I, I can't stand it. I can't get on board with that. Make, call me slow with all this stuff, but I don't buy it. Uh, but with Preto, I, I'm following the chance and, and I'm joining in there. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. I was just writing about this before we came on for my Down on the Farm article that's going to post tomorrow that it's it's the walks for me that just show how quickly he's adjusting to the high A level, which, as you say, he's probably too talented for coming into it, but it's the adjustment to just professional American baseball life, the grind, and getting used to just the everyday environment of it all. You know, he went from the first nine games of the season – Zero walks, seven strikeouts to last week, five walks, three strikeouts. He's got his walk percentage up to 8% around average that quickly, and he's only striking out about 16% of the time. He's batting 321, and his batting average for balls and plays is only 293. So it's not like he's been lucky in any way on that on that front. And the power, yeah, we knew he had balked up a bit. We heard on Locked on Orioles how he had put on, what, 10, 15 pounds of muscle and worked at that while after he defected waiting to sign with the team. So – it's not fluky to me. Yeah, power can come and go for sure, but the hit tool is always there for Prieto. He might, you know, be below average walk percentage type of guy, but he's going to hit, and I think he's ready to move up. As soon as Rylan Bannon, Tyler Nevin, whoever moves up to Baltimore, I think we'll see Jordan Westberg move up to AAA, Cesar Prieto move up to AA, and Daryl Hernandez turn up to high A, and it'll just be the floodgates open from there. I think that what Prieto is doing at Aberdeen is not insignificant when you consider that he defected last May. So he had a fairly long layoff before he was signed by the Orioles. Now, we know he was putting a lot of work in because we've heard about him getting stronger. So it's not like he wasn't doing anything in that time period. But you're still looking from May to January, which is when I believe Prieto signed. Fairly long layoff. And then you get into spring training and then you start playing in competitive game action again in April, almost a full year after you defect. So for him to hit the ground running the way he has, I think is a great sign. The Orioles had him in Sarasota in those camps like the day after he signed. So they were very clearly like, we're going to get you in. We're going to get you ready for for this experience. So clearly the Orioles are pretty high on him. And it's way too early to kind of say, like, what could he become at the major league level? Is this a future major league piece at the end of the year or early next year. I don't know yet. Just enjoy the ride for right now, but this could be a massive, massive get for this franchise. If he's, it was what, five, six hundred thousand dollars they signed him for, it, right place, right time for the Orioles, but this could really uh, tilt heavily in their favor because if those reports were true and he could have been in a normal cycle, a two million dollar signing, it's a fantastic deal for the Orioles. Yeah, I think. Another thing I just thought of that might be a little underrated, especially with the Delmarva guys all coming up from Florida and the DSL the last couple of years, is it's cold. It is cold in April. How when's the last time Cesar Prieto played baseball in the cold for two weeks straight, you know, and all these guys? So as this weather heats up, I expect him to just get even more and more comfortable. Absolutely. And we'll move on now to what was an interesting story in the Baltimore Sun that ran over the weekend. Andy Kotzka, got to give him a lot of credit for writing this great article about Hudson Haskin, who is off to a phenomenal start at Bowie. As of Monday, 11 games, 44 plate appearances. He's batting 385 with an OPS of uh, 1.201, four homers, 12 RBIs. For comparison, last year in 363 plate appearances between Aberdeen and Delmarva, Haskin hit five home runs. So he's one away from tying his season total last year. And what was interesting about this article was that it really dug into the whole profile that has been out there about Haskin since he was drafted by the Orioles in 2020, which is the unconventional swing. And Haskin gives some excellent insight into kind of how that swing came to be, that there was a lot of tinkering that went on, and it took him a while to get comfortable with his swing again and that he and the Orioles put a lot of work in that started to pay off a little bit last year and has paid off in an even bigger way to start this year. So if you have not read that piece yet, I would encourage you to go over to the Baltimore sun and check that out. But we're going to talk about a little bit because Haskin, we didn't get much of a chance to talk about in our last show is off to a great start. Nick, I'll start with you. 
after reading this piece and seeing what Haskin has done over the first couple weeks of the minor league season, do you feel like there's a lot more to him than what may have initially met the eye when he was drafted out to Lane? I, no doubt. Like I know last year was kind of a little uninspiring statistically. Uh, I don't think he was the guy we mentioned a whole lot on the podcast and, you know, the injury that ended his season prematurely kind of aided that, but you look at this start, he only played in, I don't know how many, I can't do the math off the top of my head there. Let me see here. Da, 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 da. He only played 26 games. We'll say that at Aberdeen, uh, 83 games total between Delmarva and Aberdeen last year, 26 in Aberdeen before the injury happened. And they already, this is just his second season of pro ball. Not even, he didn't get barely half a season last year and they're starting him out in double a. So I think the Orioles are clearly high on him and are willing to be aggressive with Hudson Haskin. And if he can continue this, he's not going to continue, you know, a 432 on base percentage and hitting almost 400 throughout the year. But if he can stay hot and continue this trend, like, you know, we could be having putting Hudson Haskin in that same conversation. We talk about Kyle Stowers, Colton Cowles are like the top outfield prospects. I think Hudson Haskin could move into that category. Um, you know, I've mentioned before on one of our preseason shows that like, you know, Haskin, I think it was one of the, the surveys, Brandon Stoneberg, Patreon member, shout out to you and your surveys you were putting out. And we went over one of those surveys and the topics was, you know, Hudson Haskin or these outfield prospects who really emerges this year. Hudson Haskin wasn't my pick, but I said, don't sleep on Hudson Haskin. Um, second round pick out of Tulane, small school. The Orioles clearly saw a lot they like. And I love that story because it showed like this guy's got a major chip on his shoulder. And I think he's out to prove a lot of those scouts that called his swing ugly uh, and unorthodox and everything wrong. And I love, absolutely love that type of guy. Yeah, for sure. And do you think the Orioles know their players? Look at the guys that were surprised started a level higher than than we expected him to. Johnny Riser starting in triple A while Zach Watson starts back in double A. Haskin going up to double A right away. Adam Hall starting in double A. And it's all you see why already two, three weeks into the season, why that's the case. And yeah, Haskin, I know I saw him probably play the best game of his life when I went to Bowie and he hit three home runs. But I mean that wasn't like he was swinging all out and it was the best he could give the ball. It was easy power. Opposite field a couple of them just kept carrying. I mean, the power is real. And if he's figured out a way to tap into that in the games, which is what we were calling for coming into the season, then he could end the season knocking on the door of the majors this year. Keep feeding him that Olive Garden cheesecake. <laughs> That's, that was a funny story. Yeah. That was hilarious. <laughs> Haskin, I, you kind of saw flashes of the other tools last year, like solid defender, runs the base as well. Good plate approach, but not a lot of power. There was nothing really particularly inspiring in the offense last year that made you think this guy is, you know, in that realm of Kyle Stowers, Colton Kowser, and, you know, sort of even expectations, Heston Kerstad of outfield prospect. But he's kind of making a case to be in there now because not only is he a good hitter, but he's a legitimate center fielder. He can play the position. Yeah, he's not one of those guys that you're looking at as, well, he'll move off the center field. He'll move over to a corner uh, as soon as he gets to the big leagues. He's a pretty good center fielder. Yeah, he's not going to be electric out there. He's not going to be a probably a gold glove center fielder, but he can definitely play center field and at the major league level. I think, you know, he might not have Ryan McKenna's glove, but he's going to not strike out 80% of the time, I think, when he gets to the majors. Yeah, I can't look this up fast enough, but I'm curious to see like what what is that? Uh, how are they splitting up those reps? Like Zach Watson and Hudson Haskin in center field. Who's getting more run out there in center field? I imagine it's Haskin, but it's the sample size is so small with that injury. It's probably tough to tell at this point, but maybe something to look at going forward. Yeah, so far I'm pulling this up off of Baseball Reference. Haskin has seven games in center field for Bowie. Watson has six, and Adam Hall has three. So pretty fairly even split when you factor in it's three players over a small sample size. Yeah, still good start. Fantastic start. I think, it, again, just keep adding these guys. Get these pop-up guys because, you know, I, I hate to say this right now because it is so early, but, you know, Zach Watson is really struggling. And hopefully he can turn that around because he was such a fantastic story last season. But right now he's struggling. But yet we're seeing Hudson Hassan step up at the double-A level. So um, keep adding to that depth. and. 
because you can never have enough of these guys in the system. Because even if Kowser does emerge and, you know, you got Stowers up there, that he emerges, you keep Cedric Mullins, you got Austin Hayes up there, then Haskin becomes a very valuable trade piece. I feel like we talk about, I'm mentioning that more and more with these guys, but, you know, it's hopefully that time comes soon. So that's another positive here. And progression is not linear. So, mm-hmm. A lot of guys will flame out. A lot of guys will look like, oh, no, they're not going to reach their potential. And then next thing you know, they're bursting on the scene as well. And I think we've seen that a little bit with Haskin this year. We'll move on now to our final segment of the show where we shout out players outside of our top 30. And because I think it's fitting with the discussion we've had about Bowie outfielders, I'll start with Bob here. Yeah, I wanted to, speaking of Adam Hall, give him a shout out. You know, we've been tough on him last year. He had a rough season. He had an 89 WRC plus in high A Aberdeen uh, when we thought he was going to start at double A Billy last year. But he's really showing the faith that Matt Blood had in him coming into the season with a 130 WRC plus off the back of a 340 batting average. And where is it? 812 OPS. He's always going to steal bases. He's got five already. And he's just he's utilizing his skills in a much better way the walk and strikeout numbers are similar to last year i just think it's a matter of knowing who he is being comfortable with the player he is and doing the best that he can to uh translate on translate that best on the field yeah i'm sorry adam hall so far you're you're proving all of us wrong and i i'm here for it it's it's pretty awesome to see him perform so well in double a because that was a guy too i feel like they probably could have started in high a if they really wanted to but they went ahead and pushed him up to double a so kudos Driving the ball, I think the best he ever has looks really good in the outfield. Definitely an encouraging start. Yeah, and I also want to just shout out for my pitcher uh, this week, a reliever for AAA Norfolk, who we saw dominate in the Arizona Fall League, Nick Vespi. Thank you, Rule 5, for being canceled. This guy's yet to give up a run at the AAA level this season. And his FIP and XFIP are pretty much just as good. 1.23 FIP and 2.13 XFIP got 11 strikeouts over their seven innings only one walk and that first walk came in his last appearance so yeah i know the orioles bullpen has been good at the major level this year and it's not like i don't know when the rosters shrink you're you're gonna be able to get rid of the easy scraps like lakens and an injured chris ellis right now but nick vespi's banging on the door so if paul fry trade is available i think you gotta you gotta do it and replace him with the the better version he's ready that's all there is to it nick vespi's ready to go see what you got couldn't agree more. And uh, sticking with Norfolk, I'll turn it over to Nick now. Yeah, uh, so my hitter, I'll go hitter first. Uh, I'm going to shout out Brett Cumberland, another guy that I think we were kind of down on a little bit after uh, last year's performance. Being a, a hit first catcher who didn't really hit a whole lot last year is, is kind of tough, but uh, he's done a fantastic job. He's hitting 438 right now with three home runs in Norfolk. I think he had all three home runs last week. Um you know, Nottingham is still around and on that Norfolk roster as well. So I think it's going to be difficult for Cumberland to kind of crack through, but good job for him to continue to stick around and fight through, get some playing time there. Um, and then for my pitchers, I went with two guys here, Kelvin LaRoche and Ignacio Feliz. And LaRoche is a guy who I said before we hopped on that I haven't really paid attention to his stuff yet. Um, I'm sure Eric is watching, and I know Eric knows who LaRoche is very well, so chime in there if you're still watching live, Eric, uh, and give us a scouting report there. But he is a guy who I now want to watch a lot more closely uh, over this next week. Nine innings so far this season. He's yet to give up a run, just one walk, six strikeouts. A 22-year-old international signing out of the Dominican Republic who his numbers in the FCL last year weren't that great, but we know that's not always the best idea. It's just box score, stat scout line in the FCL and those – rookie ball levels, but so far, uh, so good. He's the guy who's really sticking out. Uh, and Ignacio Feliz, I mean, I just want him to succeed so bad. Former shortstop, minor league phase, rule five draft pick, really struggled in high A last year after his breakout in Delmarva. But he came in after Gene Pinto, who Pinto threw four innings, struck out eight. Fantastic job. Ignacio Feliz uh, one-upped him, which is hard to one-up Gene Pinto. He a Feliz went four innings, struck out 10, allowed just one run. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm intrigued again because I don't know how many guys can strike out 10 uh, in four innings. There's Eric. Haven't seen a ton down here, but remember short counts. We like short counts when it comes <laughs> to pitchers. So, yeah. For sure. Absolutely. So I'll stick with the uh, pitchers to start off here. Cole Uvila, Uh That's someone we've talked about a lot, a minor league rule five pick. 
out of last year's draft. Uh, through seven games at Norfolk, he's got two saves, eight strikeouts, and has not allowed an earned run. He's off to a really impressive start. And this is someone who Fangraphs has noted in the past for having a good changeup, having a good feel for his pitches. So got to AAA last year in the Rangers farm system and struggled. But I think this year is going to you know, hopefully turn a corner and could be right in there with Nick Vespi in that conversation of relievers who could help Baltimore's bullpen out before too long. And the other one, uh, Dylan Harris uh, had a week to remember for Bowie. Five games, he batted 500, 10 hits, and 20 at-bats. Two home runs, 20 total bases, four doubles, very good, two very good plays on defense. And we have to remember the slide around home plate that allowed Bowie to win in extra innings on Adam Hall's walk-off sacrifice fly. So Harris doing a little bit of everything last week. And for me, that was just way too tough to ignore for this segment. So he's my pick this week. Great choices. I mean, I was shocked to see Dylan Harris because he's one of these undrafted free agents after the 2020 draft, but he's just one that didn't exactly make an impact last year, like the Bellins, the Mundys, the Brandon Youngs of the world. You know, he had great on-base skills, but didn't hit for average or power. They move him all the way up to double A right away to make his season debut, and he just comes out on fire with four doubles, two homers. He's been amazing, and I don't know if it's just – a great little run here for him and he's going to come back to earth, but still cool to see no matter what. So hopefully he's, he could be this year's Patrick Dorian, a guy who just, you know, comes out of nowhere to be like, Whoa, this guy had this in him. Yeah. And I just remember one more point with Dylan Harris. I do remember the first time we had Matt blood on, he name dropped Dylan Harris. I don't know if you guys remember that, but he did name drop him in that show. So I thought he was just kind of a speed defense guy. He didn't really hit well last year, a ton of strikeouts. And this could be just an initial blip. The opposing pitchers probably didn't have a scatter report on this guy. Uh, but, yeah, I don't think you could ask for a much better debut. Offense, defense, base running, he really did it all. So incredible job by Dylan Harris this last week for Bowie. Also, shout out to Cole Uvila. I don't think he's given up a hit yet this year. That's a good point. I mean, he has been lights out in Norfolk. So, and yeah, no hits allowed so far in seven innings of work. Um, so, so far off to an excellent start for the Tides. We will be back next week when we'll be joined by Bowie Bay Sox left-hander Drew Rahm. Uh, Drew's currently scheduled to be our guest for our 99th. So as we mentioned at the top of this episode, Michael Elias will be the guest for our 100th episode, and we'll have a lot of other things in store for that. That's two weeks from tonight, so be sure to check that out. In the meantime, check out Baltimore Sports and Life for all the latest articles on the Orioles, NFL, college sports, and more. Be sure to hop on the message board there and join a discussion with fellow readers of the site, along with some of our contributors. Bob has a couple of new pieces up on the site today. Uh, Nick and I will be working on some content as well here over the next couple of weeks. And also continue to follow us on Twitter at BSL on the Verge. We'll have all the latest updates for you there throughout the week in the Orioles minor league system. Thank you for listening to tonight's episode. For Bob Phil and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On The Verge. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Jake Knapp is the inventor of the design sprint and the New York Times bestselling author of the book Sprint. He's also the co-founder of Character, a venture fund for early stage startups. How and why did you start using Miro? I came from this position of thinking, I don't want to be doing stuff online to thinking now when I do a sprint in person with a company, it's like, we're going to use Miro, even though we're all in the same room, because that's a better way for us to get this work done. As an investor, we're basically investing in their ability to solve problems. We're saying, we think this group of people is going to be able to solve a problem in a really great way and create value by doing it. And actually, you need to give people the tools that can help them make decisions, help them collaborate, help them visualize and see things in a different way. And Miro does all those things. So to me, at least as an investor, I'm thinking, give the team the tools that are going to help them think, that are going to make the most brighten their, their skills as smart folks. And 
Hero is at the top of that list. For me.